الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلی العظیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و نبینا ابی القاسم المصطفی محمد اللهم صلی علی محمد و آلی محمد و آله الطیبین الطاهرین لا سیما بقیت الله فی الارضین اجل الله تعالی فرجه الشریف For us, the concept of Vilaya is very important concept. <coughs> but it seems that despite all the great works that have been done on Vilaya, a very important aspect of it, which is the social aspect of it, has not received enough attention. And that can justify, perhaps, of course, not you know enough but somehow can explain why we have so much division and separation because people have not really understood the significance of the social aspect of Velaya. so alhamdulillah most of you have already been introduced to the subject so i can uh, be quick and we can inshallah focus more on the practical side of it basically my interest in this aspect started with my uh, encounter with <coughs> shia from different parts of the world when i went to come uh, it was not common to have Iranians and non-Iranians in the same school. Normally, we were separate. But uh, exceptionally, our school had accepted students from Pakistan, from Lebanon. We had even people from uh, Bosnia. So it was something very important, you know, that uh, in classes, over lunch, dinner, traveling, we were always together. People from Afghanistan. Then, after my studies finished in the UK, and I went back to Com, I was asked to be in charge of the international affairs, the deputy of international affairs of Jama to Zahra. So I was responsible for sisters who come from other countries. And that gave me, again, uh, opportunity to be more attentive to the diversity that we have in the Shia community. We had about 1,000 international sisters, about 200 boarding and 800 day students from about 40 countries. And we were trying to arrange for them everything, you know, visa, admission, accommodation, studies. Of course, those who were day students, they didn't need visa, but the rest. So for several years, I was in this position. And then we had the idea of inviting our graduates, our alumni, for a meeting in Qom. We had some initial meetings, but after two I inviting just few people, then we had a bigger uh, meeting and we invited sisters from different countries. So from some countries, we chose some representative. From some countries, uh, we had a few, so it was possible to have all of them. So I remember I was sitting in the uh, meeting, because it was maybe one week program. So one person was speaking. And when he was speaking, I was at the same time thinking about significance of this meeting. 
Like, you know, for example, our meeting today, we should not take it for granted. It's not simple that, you know, people from different parts of Canada, you know, even parts of the world <laughs> have come together. It's very important. So I was thinking about this great gift that we are here with sisters who have come from different places to Qom. They studied four or five years, then they went back home. Now they have come again here. So I was reflecting on this. And then the next day I traveled to Tanzania. And in Tanzania, uh, I was asked to give a talk to uh, Mubalagin of East Africa, who were uh, gathered in Kibaha, but they were from Tanzania, Kenya, different. So I said, let me talk about this social aspect of Velaya. That was my very first talk about this. And I was thinking maybe they like it, maybe they say this is not acceptable. Because that was the first time I wanted to talk about this, it was not written anywhere, you know, <laughs> something new. So I tried to find references as much as possible from ziyara, du'as, these type of things. So when the talk was delivered, Alhamdulillah was very well received. And I was surprised, and you know, everyone said it was good, you know. And one of the brothers, you know, Khoja brothers in the night told me that this was very important and this will show its result, inshallah, after 10 years. Of course, still I am waiting to see if <laughs> any result is coming. But the way they received it and responded convinced me that I should, you know, spread this message. So since then, every opportunity I had, I try to speak about this. So sometimes, if I was uh, for a few days somewhere, I talked about this as one of the subjects. If I was just giving one lecture, I tried to speak about this. I remember once uh, I was uh, going with uh, one of the brothers, you know, from Toronto to Niagara. That was the first time my wife also came to Canada, so he was taking us to Niagara. And on the way, I said, let me talk about this, you know. And he was so uh, moved that before we went back, he called uh, all the executive trustee of their organization for a meeting. And, you know, I explained and they said, we should, you know, do something to spread this. But uh, unfortunately, many times people get excited, but then after some time, uh, maybe nothing uh, that much happens. Or maybe it takes time, I don't know. So I used every opportunity to talk. Sometimes uh, in London, you know, a person was giving me a lift. <laughs> I was talking about this because I think this is one side of our faith that unfortunately is neglected. And that is actually something that is able to give us a boost or give us even life, this aspect of Velaya. So this is something that, Alhamdulillah, you have somehow uh, been introduced to, but I will review it. But I would like to mention another story. And in the morning, I told you, stories are important, you know. <laughs> so, uh, when we were in Italy with uh, some of our uh, Focolare friends in February 2015, and Sister Esra and some other sisters also were there, one day we had lunch, uh, my wife uh, and I, and few of them, we had lunch together, and one of them was uh, responsible for a group of youngsters who sing. They have, you know, two groups, one uh, women, one men, who sing, you know, a spiritual singing. 
And they had a piece that uh, had something also from Quran, something from Bible, you know. So over lunch, he told me that we are using this passage from Quran, but uh, he said, we have shown this to a lady that is a Muslim, and she said, this is not Quran, this is Hadith. So he showed me and I said, no, this is Quran, but the translation is not very, maybe, accurate. And then I started talking about Velaya. So it was a kind of test to see how this concept of Velaya can be presented to Christians. And they were very much liked it. And that was a good, you know, experience for me. Anyway, this is something that I think is the core of every religion and every spirituality. So it's not just the Shia, but most of the time we neglect it. I would use our references and sources, but I'm saying that it can easily be taught for Christians, for Jews, you know, for other people as well. As you know, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is Wali for all people. But at the same time, He says, He is Wali for Mu'mineen and those who are not Mu'min, their awliya are Taghut. And in another place, he says, he is the wali of mu'mineen, and those who are not mu'min, they have no awliya. So there are three groups of verses in the Quran. If someone doesn't understand, may think this is a contradiction. In one place, he says, he is wali for everyone. In another place, he says, he is wali for mu'mineen. Allahu wali alladheena amanu, walladheena kafaru awliyaamu ta'ud. In another place, he says, anna al-kafirina la mawla lahum. They have no mawla. So you have to understand, then what is the meaning of velaya? The conclusion is this, that by creation and lordship, he is really vali for everyone. He is the only provider, he is the only creator. But Velaya doesn't stop here. Velaya is you consciously and voluntarily asking God to undertake your leadership. So although all human beings have Allah as their Vali, but only some people subscribe, subscribe to Allah being their leader and their guide. Allahu waliyu alladheena amanu. So mu'mineen are the people who say, what would be better choice than having Allah as our guide and leader and guardian? But those who don't have this idea, this faith, they would follow, you know, evil and ta'ud and Satan and bad people. They don't want to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then on the day of judgment, the people who have chosen Allah as their wali, they still would have wali who would care for them, who would, you know, help them. But those who have chosen those bad guardians, they would be left without anyone who would be helping them. La mawla lahum. Yeah? They are not going to help them. They are not going to bother about them. Actually, they are going to distance themselves from these people who have followed them. The people who were followed, they would disassociate themselves from the people who followed them. So, Vilaya is something that at one level is universal, and that is the generative side of it, the takvini side of it. 
but in another level is only for select number of people that have decided to submit their affairs to God and follow God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not treat these people in the same way. If you ask Allah, please you be in charge of my life, please you guide me, then he would guide you. But if you say, I don't want your help, then he would leave you to... Even in that case, still he tries to help you, but it's not the same as a person who says, please be in charge of my affair. So, one of the principles that we have to remember all the time, this is one of the principles, the way Allah treats us is to a large extent dependent on the way you want him to treat you. He doesn't impose himself on you and your life. If you say to Allah, you know, please stand away from my life, he says, okay, go and see what happens. If you say, oh Allah, please come into my life and you guide me and you lead me, then he is kind to accept that. So, velaya is something that you can decide about it in this sense. Then, we understand from the Quran another point, and that is what one of the sisters asked, that velaya is not a relation from top to bottom. Velaya is a relation that can be vertical and mutual, so it means top to bottom, bottom to top, and also horizontal. Mu'minin who might be at the same level, they have velaya between them. al mu'minun wal mu'minat ba'dhuhum awliya'u ba'dh. So this is horizontal. You have my velaya, I have your velaya. You have some responsibility towards me, I have some. You have to obey me, I have to obey you. Inshallah, we'll explain later. So although we are at the same level, we have velaya. And also, Allahu waliyyu alladheena amanu but inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhi wa So Allah is wali for mu'mineen, but also there are people who are awliya Allah. Yes? So the relation of Allah to these people, and the relation of these people to Allah, both is called velaya. So it's not just from one direction. Or with respect to Ahlul Bayt, for example. Ahlul Bayt are our awliya, we are also their awliya. They are our mawali and we are their mawali. So now you have to come up with a definition of velaya that can be embracing all these different cases. What is velaya that can be between good people and Allah and between bad people and their leaders? What is the relation that can be horizontal and vertical and mutual? So what is this? If you say leadership, it doesn't apply. We cannot say awliya Allah, leaders for Allah. Yeah? If you say it's friendship, we know that bad people, they don't have friendship. Yeah? Neither in dunya they have friendship, nor in the akhirah. In dunya, tahsabuhum jami'an wa qulubuhum shatta. You think they are united, but their hearts are divided. And on the day of judgment, they all become enemies. Or they say, So both of them would want to do tabarri from each other. So then what is wilayah? I first started with three concepts. So I said, maybe if we have three concepts together, we can understand velaya. One is ma'rifah. 
In Vilaya you need knowledge. Whether it is Vilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Vilaya of Taghut, there must be acquaintance and understanding and knowledge and communication, some level of understanding between the people who share Vilaya. But those who are awliyaullah, their knowledge is very intimate. You know, this ma'rifa. And this ma'rifa should be extended to the hujjah of Allah. It's not just enough to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should know the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man mata wa lam ya'rif imama zamanahi mata mitat al-jahiliyya. But also should be extended to the people who are with the Hajj of Allah. So in the same sense that, or in the same way that just knowing Allah is not enough and you have to know Hajj of Allah, just knowing Hajj of Allah is not enough. You have to know the people who are working for the Hajj of Allah, so the community of the Hajj of Allah and the enemies. As we have in Ziyarat Ashura, Asalullah alladhi akramani bi ma'rifatikum wa ma'rifati awliya'ikum. So ma'rifati awliya'ikum is very important. You cannot say I know Imam Zaman enough without knowing what his community is facing and going through and what his enemies are doing. And this type of ma'rifa is what can save you from dying as those who died in the time of ignorance. Otherwise, if you just know the Imam Zaman in a you know, very abstract way, when he was born, you know, what he's going to do in the end of the time without having any impact on your life, then it's not going to save you from death of Jahiliyyah. Ma'rifah of Imam Zaman should be coming into every corner of a life. If we are going to be saved from Jahiliyyah, yeah? It means that without knowing Imam of your time, your personal life, family life, business life, community life, social life, political, everything will go to the right direction. So now you can understand by reverse engineering that what type of ma'rif of Imam Zaman we should have. Yes? Many of us know something about Imam Zaman that people who lived 1,000 years ago knew more than us. You know, if you look at books written by Sheikh Tusi, Sheikh Nu'mani, Sheikh Mufid about Imam Zaman, they had many information that many of us don't have today. But what we need is the ma'rifah of Imam, ma'rifah of the time, ma'rifah of what Imam wants in this time, ma'rifah of the people who are associated to Imam in this time, ma'rifah of people who work against the causes of Imam in this time, all of this. Anyway, ma'rifah is very important. So if you want to strengthen your wilaya, you have to invest on ma'rifah. And ma'rifah comes by learning, by studying, by discussing by reflecting, by asking questions. You cannot expect revelation to come to you. Even those people who receive revelation, before receiving revelation, they spend their life on learning, studying. Not studying necessarily by going to a school, but thinking, contemplating, benefiting from the wisdom which, which was available. So, ma'rifa is one element. The second element is obedience. Obedience is a requirement of wilaya. There can be no wilaya without obedience. In the side of Allah is clear, in the side of also dark side is attaba'. Tabarra al ladina tabu min al ladina tabu is following. So those whose awliya are taqut means they follow taqut. And on the day of judgment, when Allah calls every group of people to join their leaders, يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسًا بِإِمَامِهِمْ Then some people would join Fir'aun. 
Some people would join Musa, alayhi salam. Those who join Fir'aun, what happens? يَقْدُمُ قَوْمَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَأَوْرَدَهُمُ النَّارِ He would lead them towards hell and put them in hell. Without wanting this, <laughs> but there is no choice because in dunya he has misguided them and now they are going to gather there. And as we also said in those lectures, on the Day of Judgment, we are first resurrected as individuals, like dunya. In dunya, you are born and then you become part of a community. On the Day of Judgment, you are resurrected as individuals. لَقَدْ جَئْتُمُونَ فُرَادَ or كُلُّنْ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدَ But then, يَوْمَ نَدْعُ كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ And then after that, سِيغَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ الزُّمَرَةِ It's not furada. سِيغَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمَ الزُّمَرَةِ So people go to hell or heaven in groups, communities. So stages? Like in the first uh, individuals and then... Yes. So first as individuals, but then you will be called to join your imam. And we have that hadith from Imam Sadiq uh, in those lectures that isn't it justice of Allah to call everyone to join the people that they have followed? We join Rasulullah and you would join us. And then Imam said, Where you think you will be taken? And then he said, He three times said, Inshallah, if you, of course, manage to be resurrected as their followers, then you would be joining them and you would be taken to, inshallah, heaven. So, obedience is there, following is there. And you may ask, what about bottom to top? What about horizontal? This is something that needs attention. Can, can someone explain how obedience is there in horizontal relation. Responding to the needs. Pardon? Responding to the needs of the person. Yes, but obedience. Do I need to obey you and do you need to obey me? No, no, if we are mu'min. Okay. If you are mu'min, we have to obey each other. Yes, because, because Allah has given each mu'min the right of being obeyed. Al-mu'minuna wal-mu'minat ba'dhuhum awliya'u ba'dh ya'muruna bil-ma'roof wa yanhawna anil-munkar. Because we have this right, then we can do amr al-ma'roof. You cannot tell me it's none of your business. It's my business and I must <laughs> do Amr al-Ma'roof. But not because I am better than you. You can also do Amr al-Ma'roof. Yeah, it's mutual. Even when it is vertical, even when it is vertical, it is possible. This is a very uh, delicate issue. You know, the relation of Velaya is that type that even a person who is lower can demand from the one who is higher. So we can ask Imam for something. We can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. And we have the right of asking. When it comes to the third element, that is love and mahabba, then a question arises. Is there mahabba in the other side or not? So, ma'rifa is there more or less. Obedience is there more or less. What about love? Because the third element is love. 
The answer is that in the camp of battle, there is mahabba, there is love, but not genuine love. There is love like you love your car, you love your, your money, you love, you know, people because you gain from them. This is not a real love. This is a selfish love. A true love is the love which is not based on what you gain. It's the love because you see good qualities in another person. Because you see value in another person and you love. You feel responsible for another person and you love. It's an unconditional love. I don't love to gain. I don't love to receive. I love because I see something valuable there. Like love of a mother, for example, or father for child. But even love of mother and father for child is not very pure sometimes. Because, again, there is some kind of self-attachment here. So my child. You know, there are people who very much think about their own children, but not that much bother about other people's children. So there is a level of, you know, uh, freedom from ego, but it still can be selfish. But it's appreciated. Even this much is good. At least even if a mother, a father, is ready to sacrifice for the sake of their children, it is appreciated. Even if it is a kafir, even a parent who is not a good person or who is not a believer, has this love for the children, Allah appreciates that. Although this is not 100% pure, but at least is a step for getting rid of their ego. But the pure love is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. And the love of awliyaullah for us. They don't want us because we are giving them something back or, you know, we belong to them. They love us as such. In the opposite camp, there is, as I said, love, but this love is the love which is selfish. This is the love which soon becomes hatred. You know, Molavi has this story that uh, it's a long story, but briefly, you know, it says that there was a person who wanted to marry a girl. He was a very rich person, you know, and uh, this girl, you know was in another town, so they introduced this girl and he brought her to his place and wanted to marry, but she was always ill. And no doctor was able to understand what is wrong with this girl. One day after some, you know, kind of du'as, you know, he was informed that a wise person is going to come and you can ask him for advice. So he went outside waiting for that person and you know, so that person wanted to see this girl and kept mentioning different cities and when reached the city of Balkh, heart started beating more. Then mentioned different districts in the city of Balkh. And when reached, for example, the place that uh, the people who sold jewelries beat it more. So he kept doing this and he finally realized that there is a young man there that this lady, uh, girl loves him. And uh, Rumi says the illness which is caused by love is different from other illnesses. There is nothing wrong in the body, but it affects the entire body. So he suggested that we should stop this girl loving him. But how? Maybe if you were not wise, you could say, okay, for example, by getting rid of this man. But that was not going to help. 
because that person even become more important for him. So he said, we bring that person to marry her. So they went to that person and said, you know, we give you lots of things to come and marry this girl. And then they started putting some medicines in the food of that person, and that person gradually became pale and, you know, lost the beauty. So this girl didn't love him anymore. Then they said, Khuda Hafiz. <laughs> and when her love was over, then he married her. So Rumi says, Ishq kaz peye rangi bovad, Ishq nabvad, aqibat nangi bovad. If love comes because of the color, this is not love, and at the end it becomes a notorious story. So, many times we don't distinguish whether it's true love or it's fake. In the camp of battle, maybe there is love. You see, you know, the pictures, for example, they have the pictures of their heroes in the room everywhere. They praise them. But it's not true love. All these friendships become enmity except pious people whose friendship would remain. So, in Wilaya we have three things. Ma'rifah, Ta'ah, and Mahabbah. True Mahabbah here, but fake Mahabbah in the other camp. Now, the question is, what is Wilaya? Now, based on what you understood so far, so how do you then bring one concept? So, so far we used three concepts. So what is, if you want to defi define? The combination of the Yeah. Yes, based on what we have said so far, it's vertical, horizontal, mutual, it has these three elements. So, what is Wilaya? I'm just going to try. Um, Wilaya is a, is a relationship or a connection between, you know, two or more entities based on knowledge. Um, that is, that is, uh, or I would probably put mahabba first, real mahabba, after knowledge, like mahabba that's caused by, by uh, you know, actually knowing the essence of, of, of that element, and uh, and to basically be obedient, and, and to be obedient in a, like serving uh, that the cause or for the things that this element kind of uh, works towards, or uh, mm. obviously needs embellishment. Mm. Yes, you want to add? I'm just trying. So, if you want to combine the, the three things, is maybe when you have the knowledge that the other loves you, you'll be able to obey him easily because you know that. His Amr al-Ma'ruf is coming from love, not from something else. So. Yeah. Uh, it's also important uh, that in the case of Velaya in the side of Haq, the main reason for obedience is love. You know, when obedience is caused by love is different from obedience which is caused by fear or because you have organizational, you know, uh, instruction. You obey because you love. And therefore, you look for opportunities to do something. Yeah? If, uh, for example, there is a very lovable person. Imagine, for example, if our Imam is here or Marja is here. Yeah? If he wants something, 
we all would be feeling very honored that if I am able to give him what he wants. If he wants, you know, to go somewhere, I feel very honored I take him somewhere, yeah? It's not that I feel a burden. So when obedience is caused by mahabba, it's different. Sometimes I say to people, anything that you do out of love is different from doing out of just feeling obligation. So for example, if you want to clean your home because a person that you love is coming to visit you, you clean very nicely and even outside you go, you know, clean, you know, the pavement, everything. But if someone comes that you don't like, you just clean the minimum, even the, only the room that he or she is going to see, maybe your in-law is coming, so you just clean that room. <laughs> and put all the things in another room <laughs> something you put it on the carpet just you want to do the minimum this cleaning out of love and cleaning out of fear <laughs> are two different things if you love a subject and you study and if you are afraid of failing and you study these are not the same thing so what is Velaya? So th those who are higher than us, we obey them even if we don't understand the reason for this particular instruction, we obey them. But if there is something that I have more information and the one who is higher doesn't have that information, he trusts me and he listens to me. Because there is trust, there is love, there is understanding, okay? He doesn't say, it's not up to you to tell me what to do. No, he's just thirsty for understanding the truth. So now you were not talking about Masumin, right? You're talking about like someone higher. No, even Masumin. Even Rasulullah, Allah says, Shawirhum fil Amr. Yeah? When Allah says to Rasulullah, Shawirhum fil Amr, it means that then for us, it must be very obvious that we must seek advice. But in a very respectful way. Not that, you know, I say I understand better than you or, you know, no. Maybe there is something personal that I know better and I can suggest. Or maybe you have a personal request. You know, for example, maybe this is a very important discussion. Another time maybe we have to discuss why sometimes Allah doesn't give, for example, your request, but if someone else says, ask for you, or does Shafa, Allah gives? There's a question. Why if Imam does Shafa for me, Allah forgives me, but before Imam Shafa, Allah didn't forgive me? Is Imam more merciful than Allah? Definitely no. So why he doesn't forgive me in the first place? Pardon? To show the position, but also when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at us, maybe we are not qualified for receiving certain mercy. But when a person gets involved and says, because of me, please forgive him, then this adds to the reason for forgiveness. Maybe that person doesn't know you that much. 
you know Allah out of his rahmah hides some of our things and other people don't know about them for example we have hadith if 40 mu'min ask forgiveness for someone who died Allah will forgive these 40 mu'min don't know everything about me and Allah also has told me don't tell your sins to people try to you know observe uh, you know something to have self-respect but now that these 40 people who maybe unknowingly <laughs> say La min khayra. we don't know anything except khayr. Allah doesn't say you are wrong I know what he has done I'm not going to forgive him Allah says okay if now you would say I should forgive him I forgive I listen to you you see the beauty of dua and shafa'ah so he compromises because at least you manage to live such a life that 40 people are happy with you yeah if you manage to please 40 people and not of course displeasing hundreds of people <laughs> but if you have just 40 people who can be positive and no one is against you then inshallah Allah will forgive so the obedience can be from bottom to even we have in one hadith that Allah says uh, something like this anam muti'un leman uh, Atan is something like this you know I obey the one who obeys me you know if all your life you obey to Allah and then you ask Allah for something Allah is going to listen yeah especially if you ask it for other people he's going to listen to you these are the people who are mustajab you know we have one say, hadith, you say, Labbaik abdi. Labbaik means like here I am so the question, what is Wilaya now? The, the definition I'm thinking is uh, Wilaya is a loving relation that is based on matter of uh, not knowing and is fulfilled with obedience. Yes. Yes, but it's, uh, still this is three uh, notions. Yes. I want to ma make it one. Yes. Yeah, but uh, Velaya is not just love. <coughs> you know, Vali is not just Muhib. One sister, I think, raised also. Huh? I think I was going to say the same thing. I see. Yeah, so there is a difference between Muhib and Wali. Yes. There seems to be a binding connection between two entities. And uh, if, the, if one entity is the is dependent on the other, it's not a, it's not a, one is more powerful than the other, then the binding connection implies that one will follow the other more and depend on the other. But the binding connection is there. If okay, but what type of bonding? A binding. What type? What type? Uh, I mean, because uh, friends have also some kind of binding or a spouse, you know, parents and children. It's shared depending on the level of that, that connection. Mm. So, that's the best I can. Yeah. Is there a mutual uh, relationship based on guardianship? Well, what is guardianship? Like, being guardian of the other, so it's like, it combines everything, like you take care of them, you love them. Gu guardianship is not very accurate, I think. Because guardian is uh, top to bottom. We cannot say we are guardian for Allah. Maybe it's treating them in a way that we want them to treat us. So, no selfishness. But in, uh, we have Velayat Tawut also. They have selfishness. Justice, if you want to translate it, you give everything to two ways. 
Um, now I'm adding, I realize I'm adding a fourth uh, component, but can, can that element of how uh, or just this be the binding, uh, the binding, you know, material between the three concepts? Hak mm. uh, can be motive uh, for one, the value of Hak. But the other one, they don't have concern, have concern for Hak. You know, yes. No, these are related, but this is not Vilaya. Yes. Pardon? I don't know if it's translated in English, but I can, I can see it's Dawaban al Muhib fil Mahkub. What? I don't know how to say it in English. Dawaban al Muhib fil Mahkub. No, it's not just this. Uh, first of all, in Velaya of Shaitan, there is no Zawabanu al Muhib al Mahbub. And also, here it's, just, it's not just Mahabba, it's more than Mahabba. Mahabba is one aspect of it. Yes? What I understand is it's like to, to believe in something which is true. Uh, you believe in it because you know it's the truth and you love the truth mm. and you struggle for the truth. But what about Velaya Taghut? Velaya Taghut is they actually believe in something that um, I don't know if, if, if the power of your state is correct or not, mm. that their nafs is what I mean the first truth is through half. Yeah. So the the right velaya is about haq, but the wrong velaya no. Yes. Is it a form of um, altruism? Can you say that it's altruism? Altruism goes back to mahabba. Yeah. But uh, those who are in the camp of batil, they don't have altruism. You know, we, we have to find a common definition that can apply to both sides. Yes, how much time we have, if any? Uh, 15 minutes. 15? Okay, so we have one, 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 and maybe the, the three, because I, I want to say so, th so that you think about it for next. You w raise your hand. Pardon? Going back to the Quranic references that you get at the beginning, that like Allah is one of all, and Allah is one of all the believers, but at the same time, Catherine um, and Noel, I'm trying to see if Wilaya can be uh, uh, like a mutual relationship between, the, like, let's say, us as a community of believers, and then us amongst ourselves. Um, but at the same time, also with, uh, for example, the Aimla and the Basulim. So it's kind of like a relationship in, uh, in different ways, almost, with different, uh, different groups of people. Collecting. Yes. Yeah, it's a kind of relation, but uh, what is uh, specific about this relation? So far we said it's a kind of relation which comes with ma'rifa, mahabba, and ta'a. True mahabba or fake mahabba, but mahabba is there. Uh, Ta is there, Marv. But now we want to go further. Yes. I think uh, the thing that comes to, to my mind is purpose, because obviously all of this is purpose oriented, and we weren't created just to, you know, have a philosophical discourse. There's a there's a real objective, and that objective is the Abudun uh, and the Imams uh, showed that it's the Abudun. So part of um, the objective, obviously, both of them have objectives, like the camp of half, they have an objective, and the camp of bottom, but the content of that objective might be different. The objective of the camp of half, then it's, it's the ma'arfa, the true ma'arfa of Allah, and the camp of bottom, then it's serve serving um, kind of. Purpose. So, what type of relation is Wilaya? It's a purposeful uh, 
relationship. And any purposeful relation? Well, a common a, a common goal can that that is the, that is. Um, so if there are few partners in a business, they have also same purpose. Empowering maybe empowering the that person over yourself. You give the power to that, whether that way or that way. This is a good velaya. No, it, it doesn't. In the bad velaya, they don't empower people. So they take their power away from them. You know, they drain others. They consume others. In Velaya Batel, they consume people. They use people. But they all, they, all, they, all, yeah. they all are trying to, you know, serve a, 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 a purpose that is in the camp of Batel, uh, you know. Yes, you, yeah, you are getting very close. <laughs> yes. L loyalty is there, yes. Uh, in the camp of shaitan, there is no that much of loyalty. It's temporary. It's superficial loyalty. As soon as they can do better without you, they forget you. There is no wafa. <coughs> One sister, you, you want to say? I was relating to what she said, like giving the power is not like giving authority for the person who is running. So it's kind of habit like when you say the father is the wedding for the daughter, so he has authority or power to make decisions. You know, those who are in battle, they don't give power to people really. If you are working for them, if you, they are their agent, they try to give power to you because it suits them. But they don't like you to grow. They want you always to <laughs> remain lower. So, and if they want another person can serve them better, they get rid of you. There is no concern for development of people who work for them. Yes. Last attempt. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm thinking of just Wall Street because whoever, because it's so like, um, the embodiment of the devil himself, and all of them are, are after kind of survival, right? But in a, in, a, in a material sense, and in the camp of, so that kind of survival, that kind of, uh, how can I say, <coughs> just, just basically fana that they see in, in the material, and on the camp of half, they, they are also looking for eternal life, or, or that fana, but so can that be, you know, the, the common goal of they are trying to basically um, kind of get themselves to infinity but in a corrupted kind of approach and, and they are trying to get infinity recognizing that the infinity is, is Allah SWT. So then what is Velaya? <laughs> Velaya is, 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 seeking, is seeking that... Uh, that infinite nature that some can see in the, in the material, which is, you know, which is, uh, which is limit. I mean, they, they see it as limitless kind of, kind of being. So when is Allah is your valley, what does it mean? He's seeking infinity? No. I think, uh, so this, this relation with these three components, it has the ultimate purpose being the servant of God. The what about the other side? Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, this is also a practice for how we can analyze concepts. So first, so far what we did, we tried to focus on the cases in which Velaya or its derivatives are used and based on these occurrences of Velaya we came up with all these things but now if you want to go one step further we have to use the opposite concept to Velaya so that we can understand what is Velaya so so far we have been talking about the relation inside this camp or inside that camp. But now by 
introducing a new concept and that is what is the relation between this and that you can understand what is velaya if you look at the uh, cases that it, velaya is used opposite to velaya is adawa allahumma waliman wala wa adiman ada or for example we say ataqarrabu ila allah thumma ilaykum bi muwalatikum wa muwalat awliyaikum wal bara'at min a'daikum or akramani bi ma'rifatikum wa ma'rifat awliyaikum wa razaqani al bara'at min a'daikum so people in each camp from top leadership which is Allah or Ta'ud to the intermediate lower level they have velaya between them but people of this camp compared to the people of the other camp between them is Adaw okay so now you can understand what is the difference Wali and Aduf by comparison you can Aduf is the one who wants to harm you who wants to stop you achieving your goals Wali is the one who works with you to achieve those goals so it's like people who are in the same army who have the same goal you can have leadership hierarchy different tasks but all of you share the same destiny if you succeed you all succeed if you fail you all fail yeah and aduv is the one who is who belongs to an opposite camp which is organized they have set up their ideals their aims goals procedures everything and they succeed if you fail and they, they fail if you succeed so this is the difference between wali and aduv in arabic we have aduv sometimes opposite to sadiq which is friend and enemy that's lower than this friend is not wali but uh, aduv when it is used opposite to wali means a person who belongs to an organized group against you therefore we can say velaya is belonging to the same camp belonging to the same party and this is why the Quran says innama waliyukumullahu wa rasooluhu walladheena amanu alladheena yuqimuna as-salata wa yu'tuna az-zakata wa hum raki'oon وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَإِنَّ حِزْبَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْغَالِمُ So, يَتَوَلَّ means حزب حزب means organized group you cannot have حزب without organization you cannot have حزب without having clarified aims and objectives leadership how the instructions come and go responsibility everything <laughs> is there in the concept of hesp so we have in the history of mankind two hesps in the largest scale the camp of light and truth and values in which there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prophets holy people believers good people and the opposite camp but 
we have many, many people who don't belong to any of these two camps. And this is a big mistake to think that either people are for you or against you. Because there are many people who have not made up their mind where they should, you know, belong. They don't have any clear aims and purpose in their life. They are just thinking about, you know, their day-to-day -day life. They want to just enjoy themselves. They don't want to harm anyone and they don't want to support anyone. Therefore, we have two camps, but three groups of people. We have Awliyaullah and the camp of Allah. We have Awliyaul Shaitan and we have Muzabzabina Bayna Dalik. La ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula. There are many people who are in between. And many times, actually, these are the majority. Many times, the majority are in between. If you are able to reach out to them, you can win them. If you leave them to the other camp, they can win them. And great success comes based on how you <laughs> interact with these people in between. Unfortunately, sometimes we think, you know, all the people are, you know, maybe against us. They are not, you know, listening to the haq. It's not the case. First of all, even the people who are in the opposite camp, even at a level like Fir'aun, you should speak with them. So even with the leadership of the opposite camp, you should be able to... Hopeful. But there are many people who don't be like them. Maybe they are employed by them, you know, but it doesn't mean that they are the valley of them, you know. Maybe millions of people are employed, but it doesn't mean that they are their people. In the same way that maybe there are people who are employed by Imam Ali and appointed by Imam Ali, but they are not awliya of Imam Ali. So there can be also people employed by Muawiyah and they are not awliya of Muawiyah. People look for job, and many people does, don't bother whether it's Ali giving them job or Muawiyah. They want a job, so you shouldn't think everyone who is working for Muawiyah is a bad person. Yes, we don't accept this and we don't endorse you know working for Muawiyah, but it doesn't mean that every person who works for Muawiyah is a bad person. You know, I mean in principle, in the sense that belongs to the opposite camp. Yes. opposite to Velaya is Adawa, then the relation between the people of the camp is Tawalli and the opposite is Tabari or Bara'a. So when you want to introduce your relation with the people of the same camp, you say Tawalli. When you want to introduce your relation with the people of the other camp, you say Tabari or Bara'a. So Velaya is opposite to Adawa, Wali is opposite to Adov, but Tawalli is opposite to Tabari. So then Bara'a is based on Adawa. So because they are Adov, you distance yourself and this is very natural because you are working for justice they are working for injustice so you have to distance yourself you cannot work together yeah but this doesn't mean that you don't talk to them or you don't meet them no some, some people make a mistake when the quran says don't take for example you know some people, you know, that I don't want to mention, you know, from other faiths, for example, don't take them as your awliya. Some people think it means that we shouldn't make friendship with uh, non-Muslims, you know. But the Quran says, let me read, لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء من دون المؤمنين With what we have said so far, it's very clear. It means that you are changing your camp. It's not that you are in the camp of Haq and talking and having friends from 
non-Muslims. It's not a problem. You want to get them closer to the camp of Haq. It's not a problem. The problem is that you leave Mu'minin and then you go to the opposite camp, which are not opposite camp just because they are not Muslim. They are opposite camp because they fight against Haq. You know? It's not that every non-Muslim is in camp of battle. There are many non-Muslims who may be in the camp of Haq. If you look at the world today, okay, this is the last thing. If you look at the world today, and I think always in history it's like this. If the main, for example, aim of the camp of Haq is Qist and a social level, and is commitment to truth on a personal level, there can be non-Muslims, non-Shia or non-Muslims who are working very hard for this cause. And they are working for Imam Zaman without knowing Imam Zaman. But they are working for Imam Zaman. And there might be Shia or non-Shia Muslims who are working against this. So it's very, you know, unwise to think that we can settle issue by looking at people's faith. If they are not Muslim or Shia, they belong to the other camp. If they are Muslim or Shia, they belong to this camp. No, it's dependent on what you have dedicated your life to achieve. What is your main purpose in your life? Do you want Allah's causes to be achieved or you want satanic causes to be achieved? This is the main thing. Pardon? Sa'id? Sa'id. Yes, and also your efforts. Okay, so inshallah we continue the discussion uh, in the afternoon. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Oh, 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 oh,